good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the LIS Academy for inviting me to give this uh, first lecture in the seminar series and also to give me the privilege of talking during the National Library Week. Uh, the subject that I'm going to talk to you this morning is the subject of science publishing. And I have titled my lecture, as you can see on my first slide, as Greed, Vanity, and the Decline of Scholarship. So I am going to tell you something about how the history of science publishing has brought publishing to a stage where I think we are in the midst of a major crisis. In the backdrop in the first slide, you will see the J.R.D. Tata Memorial Library of the Indian Institute of Science. This is the library which, in which I spent much of my first 30 years at the Indian Institute of Science. From 1974 to 2005, I was a regular visitor to this library and would spend a great deal of time every week in the library. In 2005, when I became the director of the Indian Institute of Science, of course, I spent less and less time in the library. But 2005 was also the time when the internet came in full force into the campus. And by that time, we all had begun to look and turn to computers for all our information. At the beginning of my lecture, I would like to show you a favorite quote of mine. This is by Lewis Carroll, writing under his real name, Charles Dodson. He was the author of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, and he made a definition of man. He said the proper definition of a man is an animal that writes letters, because in the 19th century, everybody wrote, wrote letters to everybody. Even in the 20th century, everybody wrote letters to everyone else. We all wrote letters until email came along towards the end of the 20th century. And we no longer write emails. What we do is we write, uh, we tweet, or we send messages on our smartphones. But what are scientists? How do you define scientists? I would like to use paraphrase Carol and define scientists as animals who like to write papers. So they still like to write pa papers. And Therefore, the field of scientific publishing has grown over many centuries. The first scientific journal, and that is pictured on my slide here, is dated to 1665. That is the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. It's a journal which has completed well over 350 years of existence. But in the 17th century, there was only one journal. The other journals came later. All these journals came in Europe, they came in England, they came in Germany, they came in France. Annal and Der Physik appeared in the period 1790 and 1799. Annal and Der Physik is the journal which in 1905 Albert Einstein published his three famous papers. In one issue of, in, of 1905, they were the famous papers on the photoelectric effect, on Brownian motion and relativity. That is what is called the Annus Mirabilis of physics. In 1832, Annal and der Chemie, again a German publication appeared, and in 1868, Berichte. These are all old journals coming in physics and chemistry from Germany, from England, and also I have not put the French journals here. I have pictured eight journals on this slide. The top row are all the old journals of the 18th and the 19th centuries. The bottom row is the one which shows you the first issue of Nature, 1869. The first issue of the Journal of the American Chemical Society, 1879. Science, 1880. And the Physical Review, 1893. You can see that by the end of the 19th century, the United States of America had begun to enter the picture with the American Chemical Society and the American Physical Society beginning their journals and the American Association for Advancement of Science beginning the journal Science. Today, Nature, Science, the Journal of the American Chemical Society and the Physical Review are among the most important professional journals for scientists all over the world, physicists and chemists in particular. 
But libraries and journals have been connected for a very long time. I don't know how many of you have had the chance to see this paper in Science, October 1927, entitled College Libraries and Chemical Education, because at that time chemistry was a very important subject. When I give this talk in the Indian Institute of Science, I must remind you that when the Indian Institute of Science began in 1909, it had only two departments, a department of chemistry and a department of electrical technology. Why was this so? This was because at that time, the two most important things for a country's industrialization were chemicals and power. And therefore, these were the two departments which were actually started. College libraries, therefore, in America had the great need to get journals in physics and chemistry. And the librarians had the problem that they must balance their budgets. So they were given a limited amount of money and they must now procure all the journals that their faculty and students would want. So in 1927, Gross and Gross pr produced this paper. What they did was they took the journal of the American Chemical Society and went through all the references in those papers. They asked the question, what did the authors publishing in the journal of the American Chemical Society, what journals did they cite? And they made this list. You can see the beginnings of what we today call the science citation index in this paper. And right at the top of the list was Berishte. And in the library of the Indian Institute of Science, there are the old volumes of Berishte, but nobody looks at them now because Berishte has actually disappeared. But as you go down, you will see right at the bottom of this list are the journals which are most important today, Science, Nature, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. This paper appeared less than a century ago, and you can see how the world of science has transformed in the century. So now we require other journals in the library. Many of the journals on this list, Berishte, Annalen, Annalen der Physik, all of them have now lost their importance or have disappeared. So how has science publishing changed? And what are the factors that have made science publishing change? I've used two words in my title, greed and vanity. Greed, I refer to science publishers. Vanity, I refer to scientists. And I'm going to describe why I do this. On this slide, you'll see a cartoon. And on this cartoon, we are in a corporate office. And the CEO of the company says that it turns out the public hates the culture of corporate greed. And the public does hate the culture of corporate greed. But what is the reaction in the boardroom of a big corporation? They say, let's figure out how we can monetize that hate. That hate has actually been monetized. If we have a hate for paid access journals, they, we have converted to open access journals for which we still pay, except that originally the library is paid, today the author pays, that means the institution pays. I have been on all sides of the academic spectrum. I have been a very poorly paid academic. I have moved up the academic ranks to become the administrator at the top of an institution. I have been an editor of a journal. I have been a referee. I have at one time been also the publisher of current science. So in all of this, it turns out that uh, I've seen everything about scientific publishing, and that is why I'm talking about it to you. In 2010, and I'm quoting here from an article in The Guardian which I've referenced, Stephen Buranyi says that in 2010, Elsevier's scientific publishing arm reported profits of 724 million pounds on just over 2 billion pounds in revenue. It was a 36% margin, higher than Apple, Google, or Amazon posted that year. And remember that the year 2010, the Western world was just coming out of the Great Recession of 2008. That was when President Obama took office and took office in the midst of a recession. But despite every other industry suffering falling profits, the only industry which stayed profitable is the science publishing industry. This year we are in the midst of a pandemic. Every industry is suffering. Some industries are actually being wiped out. 
Nevertheless, you will find that the science publishing industry will maintain its margin of about 40% even this year. And you must ask yourself the question, why is this so? Because as librarians, you are the people who are paying the money for everything that we buy from the science publishers. By 2020, even the open access movement has been hijacked to maximize corporate revenues. Pay and publish, both mainstream journals and predatory journals are doing this. Some time ago, a correspondent for the journal Nature uh, asked me over the telephone answers to some questions on open access and predatory journals. One of the questions was that India is a center for predatory journals. What do you think about it? I said, well, there are two kinds of predatory journals. There are predatory journals which are truly predator predators. And there are other journals which pretend to be respectable, which are also predators, because they're taking away your money and making authors pay for publishing their work. And Nature, the American Chemical Society, many respectable publishers now, the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, all of them now take money for publication. In The Guardian in 2011, I read an article. At that time when I read it, I was really excited because I was then the editor of Current Science and I would have to write an editorial every fortnight. And the title of the article was, Academic Publishers Make Murdoch Look Like a Socialist. Murdoch is Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch is still around. He's one of the most important uh, uh, news media owners in the West, in uh, America, in Australia, in England, and so on. And for a while, Murdoch's Macmillan were the pub Murdoch owned Macmillan, and Macmillan were the publishers of Nature. Today, of course, the Nature Publishing Group has been taken over by Springer. And I will read from his article. He asks, who are the most ruthless capitalists in the Western world? Whose monopolistic practices make Walmart look like a corner shop and Rupert Murdoch look like a socialist? You won't guess the answer in a month of Sundays. While there are plenty of candidates, my vote goes not to the banks, the oil companies, or the health insurers, but wait for it the academic publishers. Theirs might sound like a fusty and insignificant sector. It is anything but. Of all the corporate scams, the racket they run is most urgently in need of referral to the competition authorities. This is a powerful indictment of the academic publishing sector published in 2011. I wrote about it at that time. Nobody read it, and everybody still cozies up to the academic publishers. He goes on to say, reading a single article published by one of Elsevier's journals will cost you $31.5. Springer charges 34.9 euros. Wiley Blackwell, $42. Read 10 articles and you pay 10 times. And the journals retain perpetual copyright. You want to read a letter printed in 1981, that'll be 31.50. This is what you pay. Fortunately, in India, nobody pays and reads. Or I might add, sometimes very few people actually read. And they read only what is accessible to them. They don't read what is not accessible. Of course, if you go into a library, and this is in 2011, and in parentheses he adds, if it still exists, they too have been hit by cosmic fees. The average cost of an annual subscription to a chemistry journal is $3,792. Some journals cost $10,000 a year or more to stock. The most expensive I've seen, Elsevier's Biochemica, Biophysica, Acta, is $20,930 for the annual subscription. Though academic libraries have been frantically cutting subscriptions to make ends meet, journals now consume 65% of their budget. Now it is probably closer to 90% of their budgets. Except in India, librarians don't bother about this because somebody else gives them the money, and they work with the money that they have been given. But what do academic publishers do? They get their articles from authors. The peer review is conducted by other scientists. The editor has also not paid anything. So everything is done, and the material they publish was commissioned and funded, not by the publishers, but by government research grants and academic stipends. But to see it, we must pay again and through the nose. 
And this is because the academic community is not a united community. It is a completely divided and scattered and a leaderless community. The returns are astronomical, he said in 2011. And I've already told you the answer, 36% margin. But Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley, who have bought up many of their competitors, now publish 42% of journal articles. In fact, the only analogy that I can see to this is the rise of Reliance and Reliance Geo, where they are just about monopolizing an entire industry. Monopolies are very dangerous, and that is something that everybody must realize. The publishers claim they have to charge these fees as a result of the costs of production and distribution. There are no more printed journals. Uh, there, uh, there is no cost of production. The author produces on a template everything. You don't even need staff. And much of their editorial work, very little of it, proofreading, is now subcontracted to India. And they pay very little to the people who are working in the Indian companies who are now uh, doing spell checks on the manuscripts which have been accepted for publication. Springer's words, and these are Springer's words, that they develop journal brands and maintain and improve the digital infrastructure which has revolutionized scientific communication in the past 15 years. They've done nothing. Yet the Indian Academy of Sciences, of which I'm a member, has sort of given all its journals to Springer. Fortunately, only the journal that I edited, Current Science, for many years still remains outside the Springer ambit. It is somewhat ironic sometimes to go to the Springer site to see that you have to pay to read something which is open access somewhere else. There was a study conduct conducted by the Deutsche Bank, and I quote from this article, we be and what the Deutsche Bank report says is this, we believe the publisher adds relatively little value to the publishing process. If the process really were as complex, costly, and value added as the publishers protest that it is, 40% margins would not be available. No industry has figured out a way of getting 40% margins, except you have that in science publishing. And then I'm going to, the rest of it that I'm going to tell you is going to be stories. He goes on to add, perhaps it's not surprising that one of the biggest crooks ever to have preyed upon the people of this country, he means the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Robert Maxwell made much of his money through academic publishing. He wrote this in 2011. When I read this almost 10 years ago, the first thing I did was immediately go and start reading about Robert Maxwell. When you asked me to give this lecture, I remembered everything that I'd read, but today with Google, it is so easy to find everything that you have read several years ago and then document it. And that's what I've done on the subsequent slides. In 2019, again in The Guardian, this is by an author, Carolyn Davis, entitled The Murky Life and Death of Robert Maxwell. And there are some interesting pictures on this slide. You will see that Robert Maxwell was owner of sports clubs. He was the owner of many, many things. And the pictures are illustrative. When he died in 1991, he was right, running a pension fund. And there are the workers out on the streets with posters saying, we was robbed because their pension funds had disappeared. A description of Maxwell, he rose from impoverishment as a Czechoslovakian refugee to become a decorated war hero during the Second World War, a businessman, a labor member of parliament, then a media mogul amassing private jets, helicopters and Rolls Royces en route. It sounds almost like Donald Trump. So he was a businessman exactly in the same way, accumulating wealth, power, and political power also on the way. But in 2017, The Guardian had carried another article on asking a question, is the staggeringly profitable business of science publishing bad for science? And today I believe it is. What Maxwell did was, Maxwell was a remarkable man, whatever you may say, He's a character about whom a movie must be made. He's a remarkable man. He was a war hero. And in 1950 or 51, 
what he did was he bought a small publishing house which was going out of business. This was a publishing house called Butterworths in England and eventually built from it what is called Pergamon Press. He then realized that scientists have conferences and therefore the best way to get good papers for the journal that you want to start, he had a scientist as a partner, is to go to these conferences. And then once he went to the conferences, he realized what he had to do. He said, scientific conferences tended to be drab, low ceiling affairs. But when Maxwell returned to the Geneva conference that year, he'd attended a conference in Geneva the previous year, he went back the next year. He rented a house in nearby Cologne, Belarif, a picturesque town on the lakeshore, where he entertained guests at parties with booze, cigars, and sailboat trips. Scientists had never seen anything like him. He always said, we don't compete on sales, we compete on authors. Albert Henderson, a former director at Pergamon, told the author of this article, we would attend conferences specifically looking to recruit editors for new journals. There are tales of parties on the roof of the Athens Hilton, of gifts of Concorde flights across the Atlantic, flights of scientists being put on a chartered boat tour of the Greek islands to plan their new journal. In later years, Elsevier and many of these major publishing houses have had conferences for librarians in exotic locations in order to bring librarians on their side while they pay astronomical charges for their journals. Maxwell noted in 1988, after he'd become very successful, scientists are not as price conscious as other professionals, mainly because they are not spending their own money. In 1991, in order to finance his impending purchase of the New York Daily News, Maxwell sold Pergamon to its quiet Dutch competitor. Who was this quiet Dutch competitor? That was Elsevier. He sold Pergamon Press to Elsevier for $440 million. And as you will see on my next slide, he had purchased Butterworths in 1951 for 13,000 pounds. He sold it for 440 million pounds. He was truly an entrepreneur whom we must celebrate because he understood something. He called science a perpetual financing machine. And uh, on the right hand side of the, on the left hand side, you see Robert Maxwell, a larger than life figure. On the right hand side, you see the journal Tetrahedron Letters, a journal of organic chemistry, which I used to look at when I was a young student. It started in the 1960s. It has as its two editors, two of the most celebrated organic chemists of the 20th century, Alexander Todd, who won a Nobel Prize, and Robert Woodward, who not only won a Nobel Prize, was, was, but was more or less celebrated as the high priest of organic chemistry. These were the founding editors for his journal. He had hosted, wined, and dined them, and got their names onto his journal. He later on bought castles in England and entertained the most important scientists of the world. He then produced letters journals. He said, scientists like to produce. So if I had the journal Tetrahedron, let me produce Tetrahedron letters. He introduced photo offset printing. So the author did the typing, author did everything. All you did was photograph it and print it again. This was now a perpetual money-making machine. He then expanded the letters journals to every field of science. And therefore, he invented what I will describe on the next slide. But right at the bottom of the slide, I show you a paper in tetrahedron letters, written by one of the most important chemists of the 20th century, Carl Gerasi. The title of the paper I will read you. It's a technical paper. Novel Magnetic Circular Dichroism Spectra of Monoacetyl Porphyrins, Structural Implications. Who is it dedicated to? It's dedicated to Robert Maxwell, founder and publisher of Pergamon Press on the occasion of his 60th birthday. So here we have one of the most important scientists of the 20th century, the man who actually was behind the work on steroids which led to the oral contraceptive pill, Carl Gerasi now writing, dedicating a paper to the publisher Robert Maxwell. Robert Maxwell died in mysterious circumstances in 1991. He was on his yacht when he fell overboard and drowned. 
The story still goes around. Was he drowned or was he murdered? Did somebody push him overboard? What was he really? Among, he had very good connections in Israel because his funeral was attended by the then president of Israel and the prime minister of Israel. The question was, was he a spy for the Israeli secret service, Mossad? So here was a man about whom we must read because this is the kind of life that one must celebrate because it illustrates the kind of ingenuity that humans can really have. But I show you on this slide how science publishers are being checkmated. They are being checkmated by a young girl, a student doing her PhD in Kazakhstan, Alexander El Bakyan. And what she's done is she has produced this website, SciHub, a portal where you can actually download just about anything. Mon Bayo writing again in The Guardian in 2018 calls El Alexandra El Bakyan's service, a pirate web scraper service, has done more than any government to tackle one of the biggest ripoffs of the modern era, the capture of publicly funded research that should belong to us all. Everyone should be free to learn. Knowledge should be disseminated as widely as possible. No one would publicly disagree with these sentiments. And here is the most important sentence. Yet governments and universities have allowed the big academic publishers to deny these rights. Now I come to the second word that I used in my title, vanity. How do you describe vanity? I put a picture on this slide. You will all remember Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And there, the wicked queen in Snow White will look in the mirror and ask, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror will always answer, thou, O queen, art the fairest in the land. But then one day, the mirror will tell her, Snow White, O queen, is the fairest of them all. And thus, the story will begin. The queen was vain. So are scientists. On the left of the slide, I picture a journal, a modern journal, which is probably the most celebrated journal in biology today, the journal Cell. The journal Cell was started by MIT Press in 1974. It was started by a wonderful scientist, Benjamin Levin. And Benjamin Levin was a very interesting person. Not only did he start this journal, but he recognized something like Rupert Murdoch. He recognized something that is needed. R Murdoch introduced letters journals. Levin now realized that we must have a journal in which if you publish a paper, you publish only one paper. The paper is a totally complete paper. It may take many, many years to write, but it is a complete paper. I quote now, and this uh, is a quotation from an article, again, to which I've referenced in The Guardian. And the quotation is from a Nobel laureate biologist, Randy Sheckman. And what Sheckman says is this, Levin was clever. He realized scientists are very vain. So did Murdoch. Murdoch also realized that scientists are vain, and he sort of got the most important scientists and plied them with various things. He said, scientists are very vain and want to be part of a very selective club. And therefore, he created a journal in which you can be a very member of a very selective club if you publish in that journal. And you had to get your paper into cell. Sheckman says, I too was subjected to this kind of pressure. He ended up publishing some of his Nobel cited work in Cell. In 1986, Sheckman created Cell Press. And in 1999, Cell Press was acquired by Elsevier. From 1999, Indian biologists began to recognize Cell as a very important journal. And today, Cell is the most celebrated journal among Indian biologists. But I will also give you another reference on this slide. It's by a very famous biologist, Solomon Snyder, the man who discovered the opiate receptor in the brain and the endogenous antagonist for the opiate receptor. Solomon Snyder's article has, is a very interesting title, Science Interminable, Blame Ben, and a question mark. What did Ben do? Ben exhorted authors to refrain from publication until they had completed their stories. The exact opposite of Maxwell. 
He recruited the leading molecular biologists of the day as authors. Exactly the same thing that Maxwell had done, recruiting the most important scientists to his side, advocating that they publish in his journal the best of their research. Once the most important scientists have published in a journal, all the new upcoming scientists will also like to publish in the journal, because then only do they get peer recognition. This is where vanity drives scientists and the need to belong to exclusive clubs. So what did Maxwell give us in science publishing? He also gave us what I call the least publishable unit. This is not my term, but is a term which I heard many, many years ago when I was young. Tetrahedral letters is an example, but there are many other letters journals which are present. Then came cell press. What did Levin give us? What did Benjamin Levin give us? He gave us a deluge of data and a complete story. He introduced the word story into the common language of biology. Today I hear young biologists saying that they would like to complete a story. Sometimes when I hear the word story, I always think of fiction. Therefore one must be aware of the kind of pressures that there are to complete stories, to completely prove hypotheses which may not be strictly proven by experimental data. And which is why today the scientific literature in biology and many other very rapidly advancing fields has run into so much trouble. But when we talk about journals, we ask some very simple questions. Who produces journals? Publishers, editors, authors. Who should pay for journals to survive? Readers, that's what libraries were doing all the while, and authors, open access and research grants. Now if you analyze the situation today carefully, you're paying both ways. The institution pays its faculty to uh, give open access, or the government, to pay open access charges. The library continues to pay Elsevier for bundled journals, uh, pay Springer for bundled journals, pay Wiley for bundled journals. When you get bundled journals, when you get 1,000 bundled journals, do you think anybody reads 1,000 journals? Nobody. If the library conducted a survey on how many journals their readers read, and that was done at the Indian Institute of Science many, many years ago, you will find that they read very few journals. They don't read most of the journals. How many journals do they cite? They cite very few journals. Certainly not a thousand. How much profit should the commercial publishers make? We ask this question of pharmaceutical industry. How much profit should a pharmaceutical industry make? Tomorrow if a COVID vaccine comes or a COVID therapeutic comes, you don't want to pay $1,000 to get a vaccine. No. You would like to get it cheap. If possible, you'd like to get it free. Publishers exploit human weakness and the vanity of scientists. But what has now given scientists an opportunity to become even more vain than they were. On this slide I show you the beginnings of scientometrics because you're also a society for library and information science. And information science, at least in the eyes of librarians, has been associated with scientometrics. Actually, information science is more a branch of computer science than of library science. Eugene Garfield, who died a short while ago, introduced current contents many years ago. He also introduced the citation indexes for science in a wonderful paper published in Science in 1955, which I've referenced here. He calls this, he says, this new bibliographic tool like others that already exist is just a starting point in literature research. It will help in many ways, but one should not expect it to solve all our problems. He intended the Science Citation Index to be a tool for literature research just the way the 1927 librarians Gross and Gross had anticipated. Current content was a wonderful way of bringing a digest of journals very quickly before the journals arrived. And in this very library where I'm giving this lecture, I used to come every Thursday to read current contents. I would come a bit early because there would be one or two senior professors who would beat me to it. And once a senior professor had got hold of it, you could never get it back. So one would try to be the first person to get current contents. Current contents used to be kept below the circulation desk. So you had to sign on a sheet in order to take it and you have to sign when you returned it. When the Science Citation Index was first proposed, its major objective was to break the so-called subject index barrier. These are Garfield's words. 
out of this bibliographic experiment has evolved a historiographic and sociometric tool of major importance. Like most scientific discoveries, and Garfield's was a scientific discovery, this tool can be used wisely or abused. It is now up to the scientific community to prevent abuse of the science citation index by devoting the necessary attention to its proper and judicious exploitation. He said this in 1970 in an article in Nature. All that the scientific community, especially in developing countries and more specifically in India does, it abuses the science citation index. It does not use it. Using the science citation index and using what he called historiographic and sociometric tools, Garfield was able to build networks of how science has progressed. That is how he discovered an unknown Indian scientist, Shambhunath Day, who discovered the cholera enterotoxin and made one of the major breakthroughs of the 20th century in the study of cholera. But Day was a forgotten scientist whom Garfield discovered through his analysis. So this is an example of a discovery made of relevance to India by the Science Citation Index. Garfield later on did other analysis where he looked at all the papers and asked how many times are they cited. And he found that most of the papers in the scientific literature, and I show you one of the papers that he wrote, uh, this appeared probably somewhere in the late 1980s, uh, 1988 or so, where he had citation frequencies and distributions of papers. And when you look at this, there are only 20 papers which have more than 10,000 citations at that time. These are like, if you look at the batting statistics, you will find very few people have got as many runs as Tendulkar. If you go beyond 10,000 runs in test matches, you will find very few people. And uh, that's exactly what this is, counting. He found that most of the papers in the literature were never cited. And if they were never cited, they were not even cited by the author who wrote them in a second paper. And this was interesting. He redid this again, taking data from 2005, which I show him on this slide. And this is again very, very interesting because he found that very large numbers of papers in the database of the Web of Science were not cited or were cited very few times. Greater than 10,000 accounted to 0.0% of the literature, because you have to go to the third decimal place or the fourth decimal place to find out what is 10,000, because it, it is 10,000 out of more than 38 million items, a very, very small number. Nature, in the year 2014, had this interesting picture, which I show on the slide. It's called the paper mountain. If you take the first page of every published scientific article and put it and stack it up, the height of that will be approximately 6,000 meters. It's only the first page. And uh, 6,000 meters is the height of Mount Kilimanjaro. And therefore, they said, this is the paper mountain. What's at the top of the paper mountain? These are the most cited papers in the scientific literature. And these papers are very, very few. And if you look at my slide, you will find that Hardly, a very, very small fraction of papers are hugely cited. Most papers have never been cited in the literature. This was with a much larger database than what Garfield used. We now have many. We have the Scopus database, which is Elsevier's. We have the Web of Science database, which is now with Clarivate. And uh, we have the Google Scholar rankings. Uh, nature does its own with nature publishing group journals, and scientists are enamored by all of this, especially if they see their own names on it, one of them. And uh, Google Scholar rankings I show you, they're different. But Google Scholar will have some commonalities with the best ones in nature's mountains and so on. And that you have to look at slides in order carefully in order to do this. The purpose of this lecture is only to give you the slides and give you the material, and you can actually digest it yourself and analyze it in your own way. But you will find some papers are missing. They're not there in the Web of Science analysis. They're not there in the Scopus analysis, but they'll be in the Google Scholar analysis. And I've highlighted in red only one on the slide. That is Claude Shannon's very famous paper, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which appeared in the Bell Systems Technology Journal, a journal of the Bell Telephone Laboratories where he was then working. 
Now, this was actually the first shot of the information technology revolution. But of course, it is not the most cited paper in... Uh... But why are there so many papers? Why do scientists publish so many papers? Garfield said this very well, again in the 1970s. He used to write wonderful essays, two pages, very small pages, in current contents every week. And I used to come to this very same uh, location and read them every Thursday. That's the first thing I would read, what he wrote. He says, the growth of science is dependent upon an accumulation of many, and in quotes, mediocre results that are produced by hard work. Long live the mediocrities. Without them, how could they be geniuses? So this is something that you might all well think about. Our own library and information science professionals Muthu Madan and Subhaya Arunachalam and their colleague G. Chandrasekhar have published a paper in Current Science in 2010 where they talk about the increasing number of papers from India. They say it is heartening is that the production of research papers is increasing in India and even more so in China. The next step is for researchers in the two countries to write papers that will be cited far more often than now. As and then they quote from Chairman Mao. I think at the beginning, in our introduction, we heard a, a quotation from Confucius. Now you will hear a quotation from another famous Chinese, Chairman Mao. What Chairman Mao said is apparently this, every quality manifests itself in a certain quantity. And without quantity, there can be no quality. And this is the justification for scientists to publish more papers. And it's a reasonable justification, because we need to have a lot of papers be before we have high quality papers. But in changing the landscape of science, science publishing has changed it. But the way science publishing is used has also changed it. This picture shows you the former president of India, President Pranab Mukherjee, and the title of this news item, and I show his picture here, takes a strong interest in India's performance in university rankings. Those of you who have been in universities, some of you I know even in this audience here, are vice chancellors. And you're always asked, what, are, what is the ranking of your university? I used to be asked this question every time I was at the Indian Institute of Science. And you will find that the university ranking systems are also being driven by corporate interests. This is now of what I would call a confluence of corporate interests in science publishing and in science rankings and in institutional rankings. If you look at these pictures very carefully, you will see the corporate hand in the people who are pictured on this. This slide shows you how the World University Rankings, which is done by the Times Higher Education Group, is done, and their scoring methodologies. They will, of course, have 30% of marks for research, and the only way research is judged is by publications. The number of publications, the journals in which they have been published, and how much they have been cited. So universities now need to invest in publications, 30%, if they want to go up in the ranking. Of course, every university is investing, so it will turn out that no university will go up in the rankings, at least in India. This slide shows you a comparison of university rankings of 2020. QS, Times Higher Education, the uh, academic rankings of world universities, which are called the Shanghai rankings. And all of these you can see, and you will need to see the slides carefully to look at them. You will find the top Indian institutions in these. They are not making much progress. And in some of the university world rankings, they will actually be going down. This is because the corporate interests have now made all universities now play the game of improving their rankings. So everybody is going to be improving their rankings and investing money. How are they going to, where are they going to spend the money? They're going to give money to these companies which are going to tell you how to improve your rankings, how to brand yourself. And eventually, the world of academia will become a marketing exercise in which we pay the maximum amount of money to marketing professionals and not to those who actually made the product. India has now invested under political pressure its own rankings, the National Institutional Ranking Framework, or what are called NIRF rankings, and I'll show you those. Now, I don't see why every Indian institution must be competing with itself. 
I think everybody knows when an institution is doing well or badly. If the head of the institution cannot make an academic judgment of how their institutions are doing, you don't need a company to tell you how it's doing. State governments now pay money. Central institutions pay money to companies which tell them how to improve their rankings and how to produce data for these rankings. There's an obsession with metrics. And this obsession with metrics is indicated on the slide with a paper which has just appeared in 2020. The paper is entitled, Updated Science-Wide Author Databases of Standardized Citation Indicators. It comes from Stanford University. And therefore, in India, it will be vested with a very high uh, reputation because it comes from Stanford University. In Stanford University itself, nobody will give a second look at this paper. This appears in the journal PLOS Biology, which all biologists like. But you should see a formula for calculating the career-long impact of scientists. They define a parameter C. And I show you the equation which they've used. The moment you see this equation which, you've been, which they're using, you should then decide, let's not look at this anymore. That, of course, is left to your judgment. You should now not use this career impact and go around and look at your, career, your colleague and say, my career impact is more than yours. It doesn't make any sense at all. The tyranny of metrics, of measurement of academic quality must be recognized. This is what has led to the growth of predatory journals and predatory conferences. This is correlated to publication requirements for PhD thesis submission and use of API scores for faculty evaluation in Indian universities. The academic performance index should be scrapped. The requirement for publication should be scrapped because institutions must know when a student has done enough work for a PhD. Otherwise, they will publish in predatory journals. They will plagiarize. They will do all kinds of things. If institutions cannot recognize quality, who else will recognize quality? Awards and rewards committees rely excessively on impact factors and citation metrics in the sciences. This is why today when you see some very celebrated scientists, you wonder what are they being celebrated for when you hear them speak about their own work. And this is a worry. Informed personal judgments are no longer available nor are they acceptable, because we have now decided that everybody is corrupt, intellectually also corrupt, and therefore we must have some objective criteria. There are many academic issues of concern to academic institutions and the University Grants Commission. There are problems and there are solutions. I indicate them on this slide. I know the problems, but I don't believe the solutions are the right solutions. If you have plagiarism, UGC and MHRD will tell you, use Turnitin. Use a software to decide whether there's been plagiarism. This is not right. This is not going to work. It's easy to fool software once you know how to fool it. Predatory fraudulent journals. UGC approved lists of care. UGC cannot go on approving lists. They'll spend all their time approving lists because predatory journals can be produced today in a day. It's easy to set up a web portal. And all you have to do is to go to the omics sites to see how many journals they run without an office, without uh, anything. The virtual world allows you to now have scams on an unbelievable scale. Data fraud, investigation and punishment is what is the solution. But to investigate and punish takes a long time. What it is, is, and I show you on this slide, and I'm coming more or less to the end of my presentation. I show you a cartoon of mine, a favorite cartoon. It's on the cover of R.K. Lakshman's book, which is called The Very Best of the Common Man, where is a compilation of Lakshman's cartoons. But there you have the common man, and very often in Lakshman's cartoons, if you look at the common man, he's bewildered. He's puzzled by what he sees around. And in India, you can always be puzzled by what you see around you. In the academic sphere, when we talk about all these problems, one actually wonders, is it a lack of integrity or is it just bewildering ignorance? My suspicion is that in many places, 
it might not be a lack of integrity. It might actually just be bewildering ignorance on the part of students, bewildering ignorance on the part of faculty, and these sorts of uh, problems never having been discussed openly and in a scholarly way. And this, more or less, is my last slide. I have two more after this, I guess. What is the future of library science and information science as perceived by librarians in India? I have used the word rather carefully. I said information science as perceived by librarians, because I don't believe that the perception of, library, of information science as perceived by librarians is information science at all. Library science, yes. It's the information which is there in libraries. I put question marks, not one, but three. There's the growing irrelevance of journals as custodians of quality and aggregators of papers. The ever expanding scope of digital media. The expanding open archive repositories which have now appeared. Physics was first. Biology came many years later. Chemistry, which is the most conservative, has come. So you now have open archives in three major disciplines of science, and these now expand to everything else. So once these open archive repositories are there, and we have uh, large numbers of private sites which will crop up, I'm sure, in the future, which allow you to break the locks which publishers put on digital data, the way people get information is going to change. The need for re-evaluation of courses in library and information science. What are you teaching the people who now get degrees in library science? I think this is very important. Library science is not what it was 30 years ago. It's not what it was 50 years ago. It's not important now to really teach, other than in a historical sense, what were Ranganathan's contributions. Classification has disappeared. The need for appreciation of the role of libraries as archives of institutional records is something that one must appreciate. Even an old institution like the Indian Institute of Science, in which I've spent much of my academic career, has completely failed to appreciate the need to have very good archival and institutional records, especially when you go back in time it is very difficult to find those records again, and thereby we lose much of our history. Library science, I believe, is at the crossroads. It's at the crossroads where it has to decide where it should go. And that is what I think academies like the LIS Academy should be doing, debating on this internally and then getting people from outside to now contribute to this discussion. But I've used a picture here, and this is a picture from Alice in Wonderland. And in Alice in Wonderland, you will find that Alice is going along a road, and then suddenly she, she comes to the place where the road simply is at a fork, and at the fork there will be a tree. And on the tree, sitting there, is the Cheshire Cat. The Cheshire Cat will have a white smile on its face. In fact, at times what will happen is the Cheshire Cat will disappear, only the smile will remain. So she comes to this and asks the cat, and she tells the cat, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? The cat is a very intelligent cat. The cat says that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice's answer is typically the kind of answer that we might make. I don't much care where. I just want to go somewhere. Then the cat is very clever. Cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. You'll go somewhere. Uh, Alice adds as an explanation, so long as I get somewhere. And the cat says, oh, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. Now, actually, I suspect in library science and in many other disciplines which we teach in our universities, we have not changed our teaching. We have not changed our curricula. We have not modified our syllabi. We have not changed our teaching methods. Although the pandemic has given us some cause to think and reflect. We need to do this. Otherwise, we're just going along and we're going somewhere. And that somewhere, I suspect, is actually going to lead us nowhere. 
On my last slide is my acknowledgement slide. And on this, I acknowledge the two institutions where I have spent almost my entire academic career. On the top left is the Indian Institute of Science, where I have spent 41 years until I retired. And uh, the most wonderful place that I've seen. And on the bottom right is the National Center for Biological Sciences, which has provided me a home for the last few years and where I've had the opportunity to think about many things and also learn many new aspects of the discipline of biology. Thank you very much for inviting me and I hope your seminar series will be an extraordinarily successful one. Thank you.